Well, thank you all for coming. Nice full lecture theatre. You know, when you throw a party and you think, I hope people actually turn up. <laughs> um, it really means a lot. Firstly, for Gilbert to be chairing, Gilbert was a, a superb supervisor. Not everyone gets a good supervisor. And when you do, it's, it makes such a big difference. He's a formative intellectual influence, and I couldn't have done it without him. So thank you very much. Uh, to Gilbert, and it means a lot that Gilbert is chairing. It means a lot to be doing this here. <laughs> it, it means a lot to be doing this here as well at Sarans, where I did my PhD, and which is just fan transformative for me intellectually to, to study here um, and to teach here as well. And I'm glad to see one or two of my old students are here as well. So it's good to see you all, good to see some familiar faces, particularly happy my mum's here as well. So, obviously, it's a big topic, it's in the news, um, and since the Khashoggi thing kicked off about 10 days ago, the whole relationship between the UK and Saudi and the Gulf states in general has been brought into question or come under scrutiny. Um, if you look at the, the media coverage, a lot, more, a lot more searching questions and deeper questions are being asked than we're, than we're used to. So it really is... Um, a useful time to, to, to be talking about it. As Gilbert alluded to, it's a shame that we weren't asking these questions in August when the Saudis dropped a 500-pound bomb on a school bus killing 40 primary school-aged children. It's a shame that we didn't have this scandal um, right from the beginning of the war in Yemen when Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch were saying from day one that the Saudis and the Saudi-led coalition are hitting civilian targets, violating international law. Um, we've heard news today, which is particularly dramatic, about the situation in Yemen. According to the UN, the country is facing the, wor the worst famine in 100 years. That's not the worst famine in Yemen in 100 years. That's the worst famine in the world in 100 years. And the UN official being interviewed by the BBC today talked about precedents like Ethiopia, Bangladesh, the USSR, the big famines of the 20th century, and saying this is what's in prospect if the war carries on as it's going at the moment. And that humanitarian catastrophe, the worst humanitarian catastrophe in the world is, is man-made, as the aid agencies have been very clear about for the last three and a half years. It's a man-made humanitarian catastrophe largely caused by the blockade that's been imposed on the poorest country in the region by the richest countries in the region, principally the Saudis and, and the UAE. Most of the civilian deaths in Yemen are caused by coalition bombing which bombing has been described by numerous UN studies, by the world's leading human rights groups, by the major aid, major aid agencies, as indiscriminate, indiscriminate um, up to and including possible war crimes. And the thing that I think is not sufficiently understood by British audiences is that this is going on with our assistance, not just with weapons we've sold, assistance. So we don't just sell jets and say, here are some jets, enjoy those jets, see you later. We enter into a relationship with the Saudis, we provide the jets, but also we provide on an ongoing basis the spare parts, the components, ongoing maintenance, training for the pilots, ongoing supply of bombs and missiles, logistical and technical support. Philip Hammond, who was a foreign secretary when this war started, said, We'll do everything short of engaging in combat to help the Saudis. The Americans provide intelligence, they provide refueling for their jets as well. This war could not be fought without British and American assistance in terms of that bombing campaign that the Saudis are carrying out. I think that's really important to stress. The depth of cul culpability, as I say, is not fully understood. So now really is a good time to be talking about this. As Gilbert said, my, the book's based on a, on a doctoral thesis that I did here looking at UK relations with the Gulf Arab monarchies, all six, um, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, and Oman. I started this 2012, I think it was, just after the Arab uprisings happened. And what I was interested in at the time was why sort of ostensibly liberal, democratic Britain is supporting these, some of the most authoritarian regimes in the world. And I wasn't curious, as in 
I can't believe the West is doing such a terrible thing. You know, it wasn't that kind of naive shock. But I wanted to get into precisely what was happening. You know, beyond the kind of platitudes and the things that we think we know, we think it's, we know it's about oil, we think we know it's about arms sales. I wanted to get into the concrete detailed specifics of why that relationship exists. And what I was surprised to find is that there was no comprehensive scholarly study of Britain's relationship with these states, you know, despite the fact that Britain had been their protector um, from the early 1800s up to 1971, at least in the case of not Saudi but the other five, despite the fact that the big arms deals were the world's biggest at the time, the Al Yamama deal in the 80s was the world's biggest arms deal, um, despite this long relationship, there was no comprehensive academic study of the whole relationship. <coughs> I couldn't really understand why that was. So that's the thing I've tried to, I've tried to provide, a systematic um, study, and address that big gap in the literature. Completely forgot that I had slides. If you're going <laughs> to spend all morning working on slides, <laughs> might as well use them. So the... I structured the analysis, and you'll see this in the layout of the chapters when you buy the book, <laughs> in terms of beginning with the, military, with, the, sorry, with the imperial empire history, how these relationships developed through the imperial era from the early 1800s up until, up until the present day. And then the analysis of the book itself focuses on, focuses on the post-Cold War era, which I think is a, a sort of recognisable epoch, distinct epoch in the history of international relations and international political economy. So the book's analysis begins in 1991 and comes up to as close to the present day as possible. And it looks at three main areas, oil and gas, trade and investment, arms sales and military corporation, oil arms capital, or oil capital arms. Some surprises when I was researching it, as I found out more about it, Oil matters, or rather the supply of oil matters, a lot less than I thought it would. Um, arms sales are far less important economically than I thought they were. And investment is more important. I thought the trade and investment chapter would not be particularly important. Turns out it was massive, and it's the thing that helped me crystallise in my mind what my analysis was going to be. Fundamental finding of the book is that Gulf wealth matters not just to Britain, but to a particular kind of Britain, a second-tier global military power which is trying to hang on to that status in the post-Empire era, and a Britain whose economy is run on the neoliberal model. It's that specific kind of Britain that Gulf wealth matters to. And um, I'm going to try, what I'm going to try and do now is just pick out some key points and address some popular misconceptions as well. So while we're having this conversation in light of the Khashoggi um, disappearance about the relationship, let's just pick out a few things, address a few misconceptions and myths, and then you can buy the book and see the rest for yourself. So the first myth says UK Gulf, relations, it's a, it's, there's a difference of values, there's a difference of culture here. We're like this with our Western values, with our lib liberal democracy and all that, and they're authoritarian because we have our values and they have their values. I read a lot of testimony to select committees while I was researching this, and these cliches kept coming up again and again and again. And the argument I want to make is that yeah, the Arabian Peninsula has its own characteristics, just like every geographical region. But fundamentally, and also like every other geographical region in every country, including like ours, it's contested socio-political space. There are different forces struggling for the trajectory of the country and the character of the country. And what's been happening over the past 150 or so years in the Gulf and since the formation of Saudi Arabia is that sustained British and then American support has been weighing heavily in favour of a particular kind of authoritarian rule within that socio-political contestation at the expense of other forces like the likes of Raif Badawi, like 
uh, Jamal Khashoggi, like Arab nationalists, in years gone by, and so on and so forth. This is not the only factor that explains the persistence of authoritarian rule in the Middle East, but it's a significant one. And it's a bit much, I think, for British politicians to come along now after 200 years of this stuff and say, what can you do? It's their culture. It's a bit rich, I think. Um, and this support has come through diplomatic support, arms sales, training of security forces, through the crucial years of state formation. When the oil money was coming in and these states were being created, the British were right there building up the forces of, of coercion. This guy is Ian Henderson. Some of you will know who he is. This is the guy, um, I think it was former Special Branch. He spent, I think, the 50s it was in Kenya helping with the British counterinsurgency there. If you've read Caroline Alkin's book, then you know, how gruesome that was. He was then um, seconded or recommended by the British government to the Bahraini regime. And in the 70s, he helped set up the whole system of repression, surveillance, uh, torture, and what have you, which still weighs heavily against Bahraini Democrats and so on, even today. So we can't externalise this repression and, and divorce ourselves from it and say, oh, our values are different. If values are a product of our behaviour, then... So that's the history. There's much more to say about the history, but that's just the main point I wanted to make about it. And then oil and gas. Obviously, oil and gas is a big, big, big deal with regard to the relationship. Again, I don't want to say too much, but I do want to say it's a myth that it's all about oil. I had the misfortune of having to go back on Twitter so I can publicise this book. I despise Twitter. <laughs> and so when people, when I, when I tweet something saying, or someone tweets something saying, this academic has written a book explaining Britain's relationship with Saudi Arabia, it's always some smart ass who says, oh, we don't need an academic for that, it's all about oil. It's galling when you've worked so hard. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. It's not all about oil, although oil is at the root of it. So it's not about oil in the way you think, right? So you think oil imports. Well, actually, only 3% of Britain's oil imports come from Saudi Arabia. And it's an even smaller percentage from the rest of the countries. And Britain is only marginally an oil importer anyway. For a long time, it was an oil, a net oil exporter because of North Sea oil. So it's not really about direct supply. Um, there's a strategic sense in which Gulf oil and gas is important. I won't get into that now, but you'll see it in the book. Um, Gulf oil and gas is very important to two of the UK's leading firms, BP and Shell. So when PricewaterhouseCoopers do their top 100 firms in the world by market capitalisation, BP and Shell are two of the five British firms that get into that top 100. Um, the picture is... What's the picture? The picture is the Pearl facility in Qatar... Um, Gas to liquids facility. It's Shell's biggest asset in the world. They used enough concrete in the Pearl facility to build eight Wembley stadiums. They used enough steel to build 40 Eiffel Towers. The Gulf states need this investment. They nationalised their oil industry, sure, in the 1970s, but they still need the investment in terms of the technical expertise, managerial expertise from the big international oil companies. So that's part of the relationship. Ultimately, it's less about oil supply, it's more about the, the wealth that oil generates, that, that, that gulf wealth that matters to Britain, as I say in the, uh, as it says in the book title. And let's talk through some of that. I've got a few graphs, because we all like a graph. Don't we? I like a graph, anyway. <laughs> I'll have a graph. It comes from not being a person who did much quantitative research, and then, and then got really excited when he started doing things with numbers. I feel like a proper person now. So here's the first graph is oil prices in that period I've been talking about, since, since 1991. And I just pulled this off the FT website this morning. And you can see how... Yeah. <laughs> so you can see how this oil boom starts in about, well, the mid, early mid-2000s. And I should, have, I should have given you the sort of zoom out because it's not... It's not dissimilar to the spike, the famous oil spikes that we saw in the 70s. It's like a slow oil shock in a way. The oil, the oil prices, there's sort of a linear trend going from the beginning of the period I talk about to, to, 
today. But there's these big spikes around 2014 and then, well, up to 2008, and then between 10 and 14. And all the time this is happening, the Gulf states are absolutely coining it in because they are oil and gas export dependent in terms of their economies to a greater or lesser extent. So this is income. This is income for those states. The next slide is the sort of resulting current account surpluses, the wealth that's accruing to these states. And the blue line, the, un the unbroken blue line, is the current account surpluses for the Gulf monarchies. And I've got two other lines there to give you a comparison. One's China, the red dots are China, and the uh, purple dashes are Germany. So in terms of current account surpluses, remember in the years up to the financial crash, people were saying the big issue in the world economy is these huge current account surpluses that China have been building up. All the Gulf current account surpluses were right up there and comparable in that time. So we're talking about a large amount of accumulated sovereign wealth in the world economy. At the same time as this is happening, the British economy is going through changes as well. And one of the chapters in the book is about how the two economies are a kind of fit, a kind of match in certain ways. This is Britain's current account deficit across the period that the book talks about, 91 up till today. So that's the deficit in income in terms of trade, investment income, uh, things like that. So Britain's running this huge current account deficit. The current account deficit which puts downward pressure on the value of your currency. How do you square that? How do you ensure that the value of your currency doesn't plummet despite the fact that you're running this big current account deficit? You do it by attracting wealth into your currency, in, into your economy. You attract money and investment in on the financial account. That current account deficit is an outcome of neoliberalism. If you have, you're in the unfortunate situation that like Owen is of having to deal with political debate in the media with commentators who are, unlike Owen, not so good. You have this facile debate about, well, neoliberalism isn't a thing. Neoliberalism doesn't exist. See if you can spot where neoliberalism started. This is a graph showing Britain's current account deficit, Britain's current account balance from the Keynesian era and then into the neoliberal era. And what's happening is the British economy is having its emphasis put more on financial services and less on export, exports. So it's building up this big trade deficit and that's having to be squared by attracting income. Where are you going to get all that income from? Well, how about these boys? So you see how these things match. And also because the Gulf states are booming domestically, they're hungry for imports of various kinds, goods, services, and again, this is an opportunity for Britain, especially a Britain which needs to boost its export industry in light of these structural changes that have been happening. So complementary capitalisms, if you like, Gulf frontier capitalism, Britain, British uh, neoliberal capitalism. That sovereign wealth that I talked about, we're talking about $3 trillion accumulated in, in the last figures that I saw. 40% of the world's sovereign wealth is from the Gulf states. So, yeah, it's, it's good for British capitalism in two ways. Number one, Gulf demand for goods and services helps to reduce the trade deficit. It's still massive, but it reduces it. And Gulf capital inflows help to finance the current account deficit. Again, really important. So to give you a couple of figures just to make it more precise for you, Gulf exports to Saudi, including arms, are worth 1.3% of Britain's total exports, which may surprise you. So the value of arms sales, the value of all exports to the Gulf, it's not huge, 1.3% of Britain's total exports. To the whole Gulf, exports to the whole Gulf are valued at just 4.1% of Britain's total exports. But... Britain's current account surplus with those states, trade surplus with those states, so it matches 11% of Britain's worldwide current account deficit. So it reduces it by quite a significant amount. And in addition, Britain's, got, Britain's net liabilities to Saudi are about 20% of Britain's net liabilities to the whole world. So in terms of the capital that's flowing in to finance Britain's current account deficit, a great big chunk of it comes from Saudi Arabia. So it's significant stuff, but in those terms, in those specific terms. 
Let's talk a bit about arms sales and military cooperation. Another myth, it's all about BAE profits. And as I've said just now, all exports to the, the Gulf aren't that much, let alone uh, arms sales. And there's all these other things we export as well, all, all these other kind of goods, services, etc., etc. Income from arms sales for the UK economy is comparatively small. But the importance the income from arms export does have is that it helps to sustain Britain's domestic arms industry. And you need a domestic arms industry if you're going to be a global military power. A serious global military power does not import all its arms from somewhere else because you're dependent. To, to help sustain Britain's domestic military industry, which it needs, which industry it needs to be a global military power, it needs to earn money from, that, from those arms exports. I'll just give you another graph. Um, so the, the green dots are the value of British exports to the rest of the world, not including the Gulf. The blue dots are British exports to the Gulf. And this is in that Cold War period. Ignore the dots and look at the trend lines. The trend line is the value of British exports to countries that aren't in the Gulf is going steadily down, markedly down. The value of British arms exports to the Gulf is going steadily up. We're, we're at the point now where about half of the value of British arms exports is accounted for by the Gulf states. So if Gulf arms exports to the Gulf are important, if arms exports generally are important to making sure Britain stays a global military power, then arms exports to the Gulf are really important in that context, not in the in context of we need these arms exports for our economy, but we do need them for our arms industry if we care about Britain having an arms industry. And if we care about being a global military power, you are free not to care about those things. In addition to the arms sales, the sale of these weapons systems, um, Britain has major commitments to the defence security of these regimes, not so much to the countries as the regimes, ultimately. It also has considerable privileges in terms of basing rights in Bahrain, a naval base in Bahrain. And there's also, the, as, I, as I alluded to at the beginning, the, the training of the internal security forces, including the kind of Praetorian guards around the regimes that, that supposedly um, protect them from coups. So it's a shoring up of the conservative regional order. We saw the outcome of this in Bahrain. Broad-based, peaceful, pro-democracy uprising. At the beginning, just calling for a constitutional monarchy. Um, Non-sectarian, put down with force by forces armed and trained by the British, and with the Saudis and the Emiratis coming in to back them up. Again, forces arms and trained, armed and trained by the British. So it's helping to shore up a conservative regional order. And there's an increase in the value of arms sales around the times of the, time of the Arab uprisings and after, and the deepening of military ties. So that's a big vote of confidence in those authoritarian regimes in the context of the Arab uprisings. That's Britain's response to that historical moment. OK, I'll try to keep it brief. It's the conclusion really kind of prompted by the discussion that's been going on in the last few days. Is it time for a change with regard to this relationship? Here's another and a final myth. They've got us over a barrel. They need, you know, we, we'd love to challenge this relationship, and it's all very difficult, you know. So if you watch um, Newsnight and someone like Malcolm Ripkins, they'll say, oh, well, it's all very complex. It's all very, uh, it's all very difficult. We can't just break out these relationships. Well, it is complex, but th that doesn't mean it's complex and too difficult to challenge. I don't think it is. I don't think the balance of the of power in this relationship lies in Riyadh. I think it lies in London, ultimately. The way I describe it is asymmetric interdependence. So both sides need each other, but one side, we need them less than they need us. The British, the British state and British capitalism need the Gulf regimes to sustain Britain's neoliberal economic model and Britain's military power. Depends how you feel about Britain's neoliberal economic model and Britain's military power. The Gulf monarchies need the British and other global North allies, particularly the US, for their survival. 
They need that investment, that investment that they're hemorrhaging at the moment because of the Khashoggi uh, scandal. They need that investment if they're going to diversify and if those, their, their model is going to survive. They need British and American protection. They need those arms sales. So that's the asymmetry. Final point I want to make with regard to climate change, I really regret not developing this in the book at all, really, but in light of the last few months, I feel it's really important. I'm going to start stressing it from now on. We've learned in the past couple of weeks how serious the threat from climate change is and how little time we've got to deal with it. Most of the world's oil is going to have to stay in the ground. If most of the world's oil is going to stay in the ground, these petrodollars are going to dry up. So even if you love neoliberalism and you love British military industry and all that, it's a losing bet. This money is going to dry up, or it has to, otherwise we've got problems. So now, I think, to put it mildly, would be a very good time to start reassessing these relationships. Climate change makes that a necessity, and I think this, this tragedy in Yemen, which we've allowed to happen for, for three and a half years, uh, makes it imperative in any case. All right. Thank you. I'm going to try and zoom in a little bit at the micro level on the Yemen side of all of this. Um, I'm not going to take history back all the way to, the, to David's timeline in his book of 1991 because I don't think I can squeeze that in in 10 minutes. Uh, I know there are plenty of faces in the room that um, know a lot about Yemen and certainly the conflict in Yemen. Um, but for those of you who don't, um, the conflict in Yemen really started as a civil conflict, as a civil war in 2014. <clears throat> um, I know um, both myself as a journalist and my fellow journalists often refer to it being a war that started in March 2015. Um, but that was, of course, when the Saudis got involved. Um, but prior to that, uh, the Houthis, who um, were previously only based really in, in northern Yemen, in Sada, the governor that... Um, uh, touches the Saudi border, uh, took over Sana'a when I was living there in, in September 2014. Uh, but I think when the Saudis got involved, uh, to much people's surprise, certainly uh, in the US and, and in London as well, uh, nobody was really expecting this air campaign to be launched in March 2015. And um, it was the beginning of what we're now seeing um, of Mohammed bin Salman and his uh, general response and, and foreign policy attitude, if you like, that we're now hearing a lot more about in, in the last uh, couple of weeks, really. Um, and, of course, you know, Saudi Arabia went into this conflict very much as many other Western nations had before, thinking it would all be over within two weeks. Um, and here we are three and a half years later. Um, but the reason, or the reason the Saudis gave for um, intervening in the conflict in Yemen and creating this coalition of nations, which stretch all the way from Senegal and Sudan, as well as to within the GCC, um, was uh, Saudi's paranoia over Iran. And I think, particularly from a journalist perspective, there was a lot of talk um, for many years including from Ali Abdullah Saleh, the former president of Yemen, in the, in the years before 2011 and, and the Arab uprisings, um, about the issue with Iran meddling in Yemen, about uh, weapons being smuggled. But there was very little evidence to find on the ground. Um, even when supposed shipments uh, were coming from Iran in, and were being picked up by the Yemeni Coast Guard, um, with the claims that they were coming to Yemen to um, arm the Houthis. As independent freelance journalists on the ground, we were never allowed access to see those boats. The state media was allowed to go in and, and film them. The US State Department then, um, uh, on a, the only time they ever did it, in sort of over four years when I was living in Yemen, contacted all the freelance journalists who were in Sana'a at the time, the Foreign Press Corps, which was quite small anyway, and said, you should be covering this story which kind of set all of our alarm bells ringing, really. Um, and that really sort of said it all. It was trying to push this narrative of um, Iranian or meddling in Yemen. Uh, and that was Saudi's main 
um, reason, as they put it, for getting involved in Yemen was the Iranian influence and support for the Houthis. They would go so far as to call them a proxy of Iran, um, as well as trying to restore the president, President Hadi, who was forced out of the country in March 2015 when the Houthis chased him down to Aden and he eventually escaped to Saudi Arabia and has been in Riyadh pretty much ever since, bar a few visits to southern Yemen. Um, but that is also a flawed narrative. Um, President Hadi was voted in uh, in 2012 with the, the, as the only name on the ballot paper in Yemen, and that was for a fixed two-year term. Uh, we're now in 2018, and he is still referred to by the international community as Yemen's legitimate president. Uh, Unfortunately, though, this paranoia over Iran has become slightly self-fulfilling. It is now probably at the level that the Saudis and many others tried to claim it was um, before they became involved in Yemen and the conflict escalated in, in March um, 2015. And what we've probably all heard about most initially was and still is the bombing campaign and this is not to say, I should put this caveat out there now, that there is a good side in this war. Um, the Houthis have also been responsible for uh, violations of international humanitarian law, disappearances of political activists, anybody who's outspoken against them, journalists, um, etc. But the big difference is uh, they are non-state actors. They are not supported by our governments uh, or our taxpayers' money, whereas Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf nations who are part of the coalition very much are. We are therefore in a much more privileged position to be able to put pressure on politicians, whether it be here or in the US for American nationals, um, to bring some kind of bearance on the coalition to push for an end to the bombing campaign or to the uh, a push for the political process. Yemenis don't have that privilege. And there have been now, I, as part of the Yemen Data Project, which collects the data on the air campaign, um, we are now at a stage of uh, around 19,000 air raids since the conflict began. And when I say air raids, that doesn't mean air strikes. That doesn't account for what we call double tap strikes, for example, when a a missile is dropped and then uh, another follow-up strike is carried out quickly in succession. Uh, and in many cases that I've witnessed firsthand, you will have 14 bombs being dropped on a single target in the space of half an hour or less. And that is considered a single air raid in that data. So that gives you an idea of the kind of numbers we're talking about. A lot of that is happening in, uh, has happened in, in residential areas. And certainly from what I've seen uh, from a journalist perspective, but also has been um, reported by human rights organizations, um, uh, Moatana, who is the Yemen-based human rights organization, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and many others, there has been clear evidence of a blatant disregard for civilian life at best, if not deliberate targeting of civilians, civilian infrastructure, um, as David already mentioned, the kind of um, now more infamous cases of civilian vehicles being targeted. Um, that's not a new thing. That has been consistent over the conflict and, in fact, rising every year. Um, the, without wanting to jump on what, what Owen's possibly going to be talking about, but both the US and the UK have tried to mitigate that by saying that the coalition has improved its targeting pro process is um, improving its methods and also has a, a, a supposed no strike list. Um, but the data doesn't back that up. Uh, the number of strikes on civilian vehicles and buses, for example, has risen every year since the, conf the, since the air campaign started in March 2015 and appears to be continuing to rise. Um, the other tactic that there is evidence of as well, I don't know if anybody saw or has had a chance to read yet the report that Martha Mundy did um, that came out last week. And she'd done previous research on this as well. I'd seen evidence of it on the ground from my own reporting. Is There is also clear evidence of uh, Yemen's food supply lines, agriculture, and um, 
being targeted in the air, in the air campaign in order to essentially prevent, it would appear, um, Yemeni's, ability, Yemeni's abilities to feed themselves and grow their own food. This is part of what's seen you know, by analysts as well as by myself as a kind of tactic of economic, economic siege on the country. Uh, this has materialized in what's generally called a blockade, although if you're being very specific, it, it's now regarded as a de facto blockade. There are still um, a minimal amount of imports that are allowed into places like Hadeda. Um, uh, imports still going into Aden port, a lot of it coming over land. So there are goods coming into the country. You can still go and buy your Baskin Robbins ice cream about 150 meters away from where children are dying of severe acute malnutrition. You can buy new cars, you can buy refrigerators. You can pretty much get anything into the country if you've got the money to do it. And this has been one of the knock-on effects of the conflict, has been this vast war economy that has been created out of the conflict. And that is um, making a lot of money for individuals um, across the Gulf, uh, Yemenis as well. And this is one of the biggest barriers, actually, to the peace process really now, or to ending this conflict, is the fact that as a result of the de facto blockade, establishment of a sort of spider web, if you like, of routes in and out of Yemen to bring in both goods legally and illegally uh, across the country, both on land borders and sea borders. Um, it also means that when we talk about, as David always, already mentioned, this issue of the country being millions of Yemenis being so close um, to famine of children starving and dying of hunger, it's not actually what we would all imagine as uh, a stereotypical um, famine. This is an economic famine. This is where you can go into the markets, whether it be in the north, in Houthi-controlled territory, or in the south, in coalition-controlled territory, and there will be food in the markets. There is flour, there is fruit, there is vegetables. But what's not there are the people to buy it. There are no purchases, because people can't afford to buy food now in Yemen. Even um, before the war, Yemen figures put out around 80% of its food was imported. Hodeida, the western Red Sea coastal port where the fighting is now concentrated around, was the main route in for those imports. And <coughs> food was imported and paid for and still is in US dollars. The currency now, the Yemeni rial, has depreciated so much that uh, one US dollar was worth 225 Yemeni rials prior to the conflict. It's now at around seven to 800 rials to the US dollar. So that, those foods, that, 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 that food and those goods are being bought in in US dollars and then being sold in, in Yemeni rials. That has resulted in what we now see as, as many millions of Yemenis being on the brink of famine, children starving to death, people not being able to afford food um, and you talk to children and they start telling you about the dreams they have about the food they used to be able to eat. They dream about being able to eat chicken. They dream about being able to eat cake um, and dream about the days when they used to be able to, get to, to buy chocolate when they went down to the local shop. And yet when they go to the markets, they can still see all this food but they just can't buy it. Um, and that is the result of a direct result of the conflict and of the war. And it's only getting worse. I'm sure many of you saw the reporting by Ola Guerin last night on, on News at 10 that the BBC has been um, running today. And those are common sites, but also what's not seen is the people that don't make it into the hospitals where a lot of that kind of filming is done. Uh, many people can't get access to healthcare now. Less than 50% of the country's medical facilities are actually operating. And um, when you speak to people, in, even who do make it to those hospitals with, with children, they've normally had to sell either land, in some cases their houses, in other cases their livestock, in order to pay for the transport to get to a hospital. Um, so I think even when we try and quote figures on this, 
um, it's very hard to get a real understanding um, of what that impact is because the communities of people who are struggling are scattered all over the place. They're not sitting in refugee camps or IDP camps. There are IDP camps around the country, but the majority of people have um, been internally displaced to other villages or have left urban areas back into villages. The majority of the Yemeni population is still rural, but those communities have grown as a result of the conflict. People have gone back to villages. And when I say villages, in the most densely populated part of Yemen, that's highlands. Um, that's up into mountains, many places that can only be accessed on foot. You can't even get vehicles up there. These are places that even if the aid agencies had all the money in the world and all the food in the world, would really struggle to get to them, never mind during a time of conflict. Um, but as much as we will point the finger at Saudi Arabia, they are part of a coalition. And a imp very important part of that coalition has been the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. And I think we have generally a very um, benevolent attitude about the UAE. Um, you know, a lot of people spend their holidays in Dubai and transit through Dubai and enjoy their duty-free shopping and nice beaches and, and see it as more of a, of a holiday destination. Um, but they are now the biggest player on the ground in Yemen. Um, they have the most skin in the game as far as um, troops on the ground, uh, certainly financial involvement in, in the ground conflict. Whilst the Saudis are very much leading the air war, it is the UAE that is leading the ground war. And that is problematic in many ways. They now control um, a vast amount of Yemen, Yemen's coastline um, from just east of Mokalla all the way through now up to Hodeida. So nearly sort of, you know, about 80% of the southern coastline or 75% of it, certainly the most densely populated part of the southern coastline and the vast majority of the western coastline as well. Um, they have engaged in what I can only describe as political cleansing in the parts of the country where they've been involved. Um, they have they, their view of, of Yemen's Islam party, which is a political Islamic party that also incorporates the Muslim Brotherhood in Yemen. Um, they, although they're on the same side as Islam in this conflict, um, they have been carrying out arrests of anybody who's linked or associated with pretty much um, ISLA in the south at political activist level um, and higher political party level. They have backed militias and Salafi fighting groups who they know are directly opposed to ISLA. That has resulted in internal fighting. I'm sure some people are aware and may be slightly confused by some of the fighting that they may have heard of has broken out between elements within the same side in Yemen on the, on the coalition side. And that largely comes down to the UAE um, backing militias on the ground, whilst Hadis has the ISLA fighters on his side and those two elements coming to blows in places like Aden and in Taiz. Uh, we've seen assassinations of um, imams who are linked, many of them, to ISLA. Um, we've seen this policy also fueling really sectarianism. Uh, this didn't start as a sectarian conflict, but the sectarian element is a small part of it. Many of the Salafist fighters that the UAE has supported and armed and strengthened are being led by young men who had no power or position in the community before and now do. And they, particularly in places like Taiz, um, have become very powerful. They answer to the UAE, even though technically now they've been integrated into the Yemeni or Hadi army. They are funded by the UAE. They answer to the UAE. The UAE has built a parallel army. Um, this obviously includes the southern separatists who were supported by the UAE as well. And that parallel army of somewhere between 50 and 80,000 fighters are funded by the UAE. They do not answer to the Yemeni Ministry of Defense. Um, most of these fighters who are now engaged in the fighting in Hodeida um, are included in that, uh, the vast majority of them. And these, these are technically militias. They're not 
parts of the Yemeni military, those units uh, uh, that are commonly called the resistance. They're not part of the Yemeni army. Those entires have been integrated into the army, but even when you speak to the army commanders, they, they say they don't answer to us. They answer to the UAE and to the UAE only. Um, and this has resulted in really uh, fear now spreading across, which I noticed in my latest trip, particularly in May, actually, of even people who supported and still support, really, the coalition's intervention and their help, if you like, in fighting the Houthis. Um, many people have now come to realize that the UAE are not doing this out of the goodness of their hearts and that they have their own agenda. And that agenda isn't always the same as the Saudis. That's not to put them in a scenario where um, they are going to be divided or openly divided with the Saudis. Um, but they do have their own reasons for fighting, um, both strategically for this reason of having control of the coastline, um, but also this issue over the Islam party in, in, in Yemen. Um, but I think we need to be much more aware about the UAE involvement in this conflict. Um, and some of you may have missed, actually, with the news of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, is this issue with the, the British PhD student who has been locked up in the UAE in solitary confinement since May. Um, that is only the tip of the iceberg in the sense of the, what I know from my reporting, thousands of people um, who have disappeared across uh, UAE-controlled territory in, in southern Yemen over the last two and a half years now, three years, um, because of their either outspoken views or their uh, opposition to the UAE's presence in, in Yemen. Uh, and all of this is going on, obviously, with um, UK support, US support, um, much of European support. And it's leaving a legacy. Uh, this is a legacy for a generation of children now who are going to grow up malnourished, um, many of whom are going to die. Uh, the knock-on knock effect of many years of malnourishment, lack of education, lack of healthcare facilities, uh, a fragmentation of the nation in general. Um, when you're arming militias and creating multiple groups now across the country that are all fighting for different reasons, you can drive around Yemen and you'll have to go through checkpoint after checkpoint after checkpoint. And a lot of the time you will have no idea who the men wielding the guns who are stopping at the checkpoints who they belong to. Sorry, yeah, I'm getting it. Um, the one thing then I will try and finish on then, which may pass off well onto what Owen is saying, is the fact that um, we in the UK or the UK government and the US have been very reluctant to poke the bear, i.e. Saudi Arabia and the, and the coalition in general and the UAE, um, over the war in Yemen. Uh, we've now seen in the last few days what the private sector can actually potentially do. Um, and in withdrawing either investment or their association with Saudi Arabia. But I do find it, as David touched on at the beginning, that it is slightly depressing that we've had to um, get this kind of awareness of um, tactics used by the Saudis um, to people really now across the world as a result of one journalist um, certainly disappearing, potentially being killed in Istanbul, while tens of thousands of Yemenis ha have died. I know that Ackley guys are in the audience. Um, the the 10,000 figure that is often quoted by journalists, including um, I have done in the past, has not been updated since 2016. Um, and the figures now, even from 2016, are 50,000 from the data that Ackley's collected uh, from the conflict. And that's just from the beginning of 2016 until now. So the figure is likely uh, much, much higher than that from, from the beginning of the conflict. So yes, it, it's great that we're talking about it this evening, but it is um, slightly depressing that um, it is, even as a journalist myself, uh, the death of one journalist in, in, in Istanbul, potentially, or certainly the disappearance of the evidence has yet to materialize, that um, still doesn't seem to, to, to build a ratio or qualify with, with tens of thousands of Yemenis dying. And I think we all need to think very long and hard about that.
Um, well, no, firstly, it's a, it's a huge honour to be here. Um, Dave's put together this fantastic book, which could not be more topical. Um, it's a fantastic, it's so important, uh, not least because, as the book points out, there isn't an equivalent book of this scope whatsoever, and he's done an incredible job. So please give him another round of applause, because it's, it's been interesting. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to focus on is the media. Um, uh, a, cr a critique, I suppose, of of, uh, of of the way this and the kind of wider lessons of, of how this is portrayed by the British media uh, specifically, and of course follows on from what you've just said there. Um, I myself went to a Yemeni uh, refugee camp in Djibouti back in 2015. I met young kids drawing pictures, as small children tend to do, but not of uh, of, of animals and swings, but of, of, of people being uh, killed, lying in blood with missiles. Uh, these were seven, eight, nine-year-old little girls drawing these sorts of pictures. And yes, the fact it's taken, obviously, the alleged murder, a heinous crime by the Saudi regime, a journalist formerly linked to the regime who became critical, rather than uh, the deaths of countless kids blown up in school buses on the way back from school trips, you can see the footage on, of, 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 on, on mobile phones were covered uh, in August during that horrendous crime of uh, kids laughing, joking as small kids tend to do before they were incinerated by Saudi warplanes with bombs supplied by the United States um, of America. It's taken you know, the worst humanitarian crisis on earth, uh, millions on the brink of starvation, and, it, and it, it, it's this which provokes this level of scrutiny which says it all, of course, about how the British media uh, and the Western media work. So just generally, just in terms of general critique of the media, which I tend to talk about, I think it's necessary, just foreshadowing. We're often told we have a free press. Uh, in a sense, the government doesn't control the media. That's true. We're not North Korea, not an ambitious place to start. Uh, I know that's flippant. Journalists are murdered and killed and tortured uh, and persecuted in other countries uh, for their work. But we live in a society where the vast majority of the press are owned by a very small group of wealthy oligarchs who determine, uh, if you like, the, uh, the parameters of acceptable political debate in this country. Uh, we have one of the most aggressively right-wing media's press in, in the Western world, other than perhaps Greece. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see this in the domestic arena very clearly, but uh, it's, it, we'll talk about the foreign policy uh, arena. In terms of the BBC itself, uh, what the BBC does is, you know, the... The news agenda on a daily basis is set by the priorities of that right-wing press. Uh, and as a Cardiff University uh, uh, study found a few years ago, uh, the BBC was heavily weighted towards establishment voices, whether it be the financial crash, bankers interviewed not as, uh, were interviewed as, as, as witnesses rather than prosecuted for their role. They were impartial actors during an economic crisis of, of, of their making. Uh, where you know business leaders are 19 times more likely to be interviewed than trade union leaders and so on. So that's on, on the domestic arena, of course. But in terms of uh, foreign policy in the British media, I would posit that the British media echoes the priorities, the objectives, the framing, the purported uh, values uh, of, Western, of British foreign policy, that the hierarchy of villains, which is arranged by the British media, is not arranged... Uh, proportionately on the basis of how villainous these regimes actually are, but on the basis of how hostile or supportive they are of Western strategic and economic interests. I mean, we saw that, of course, very acutely with uh, Saddam Hussein's regime, a regime which the CIA once privately described as he's a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch. The CIA once supplied him with lists of communists to murder in the 1970s as the Ba'athists were on the uh, ascendancy, uh, when in 1988, when you got the sickening atrocity, the gassing of Halabja, uh, which did not receive anywhere near the level, of course, of uh, Western media attention uh, that atrocities committed by regimes hostile to Western interests would have received, where if you look at political debate, you go through Hansard, which is the... Uh, which, which uh, documents British parliamentary debates. Uh, you see very few voices indeed bringing up in 1988 the gassing of Kurds in Halabja, uh, other than one little-known obscure backbencher called Joni Corbyn, you might have heard of him, um, who, who raised this, and the ministers responded by 
talking about the strategic interests of uh, British foreign policy and, and, and so on and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and yet, of course, in 2003, 15 years later, uh, where you were portrayed as a moral disgrace not to support the uh, calamitous invasion of Iraq, uh, partly you were a moral disgrace because of what happened in Halabja in 1988. Look at this sickening atrocity. This is what he's capable of, even though at the time, of course, he remained a client and ally uh, of Western interests, but that was used 15 years later. So Saddam Hussein moved from uh, a, a client of Western foreign policy to a demonic figure who at all costs, imminently had to be uh, removed, not least because of uh, the treatment of, of, of his own people. We, we see it in Afghanistan, of course, 2001, the treatment of, of their women, the barbaric treatment of women, uh, again, uh, used as, as, as a moral basis for, uh, for the war in Afghanistan. Um, and that point about just this hierarchy of death, and the hierarchy of death is racist in terms of whose lives matter, whose deaths matter. Uh, whether they're white, uh, so if there's a disaster, a natural disaster, and Westerners are, are killed, even if there are thousands of people in that country are killed, obviously the deaths of Western, we could go on, we all know that. Uh, and that's, that's the same in our own country, a, a white middle class young girl going missing compared to somebody from a BME background, whose lives matter more, than, and, and so on. But also, uh, lives matter depending on who kills them. And uh, if we see, for example, uh, Sabra and Shitia, the massacre, uh, in the 1980s by the Falangist uh, uh, militia, for which Ariel Sharon, he became the Prime Minister of Israel, was found personally responsible by an Israeli uh, commission. Uh, and yet this, you know, for what in another scenario would have been used to justify Western military intervention, Ariel Sharon was somebody who was fated and at his funeral wreaths were laid by, uh, by the likes of Tony Blair. Um, now, in terms of Saudi Arabia itself, just in terms of that framing, I mean, you know, if this was a hostile state, whether it be its role in the rise of the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, uh, the exporting of international extremism, uh, the fact, you know, the country where the 9-11 hijackers came from, its oppression of women, uh, the lack of any, in, of any political parties, contested elections, trade unions, democracy, the beheading of dissidents, gays, uh, witches, uh, the fact our own citizens have been tortured and raped by this regime, uh, let alone murdering a journalist. All of these, in a different scenario, would have been used as uh, pre pretexts for the, uh, for, you know, it would be a moral disgrace not to support Western military intervention in such a scenario, let alone Yemen, this humanitarian crisis, uh, the world's worst humanitarian crisis. Now, in terms of this critique of the media, if, if we look back, because I've, I've, I've had one or two uh, uh, confrontations, shall we say, with the West, uh, with, with with journalists on this uh, issue. Um, if this was proportionate to the calamity unfolding, not least given our own direct involvement, not just the arming of Saudi Arabia, as previously discussed, the billions of pounds worth of arm, but this is an this is the logistics, all the rest. We are directly complicit. We are we are in that in you know this is a partly a British war and an American war that this is uh, a conflict which the vast majority of people in this country know almost little, almost nothing about, let alone Britain's own involvement, which is itself a damning indictment of the British media. They will, whenever this is raised, I always get sent by BBC journalists and others examples of their coverage, and I'm not saying there is no coverage whatsoever of the conflict in Yemen. But the way it's framed, it's rare, often, if you go through BBC online, go to all the reports in Yemen, as I've done, the Yemeni war, almost no reports on those BBC on, on BBC Online even mention British military sales mm. to Saudi Arabia or any British involvement. You would read these reports, BBC Online being one of the most read uh, online sources on earth, and you would have absolutely no knowledge whatsoever of any British involvement whatsoever in this conflict. Now, if we go back to, I don't know, the Kosovo war and the build-up to that war on a daily basis, you would get examples front page on every single broadcast news of, of the sickening atrocities being committed. And yet, clearly that isn't the case with Yemen. It is a conflict which is very poorly reported, except for brave reporters who, are, who, who have been on the ground despite uh, the dangers in, uh, in, 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 and, and so on. And it's very difficult to access Sana and get to Yemen at the moment. But even domestically, British defence correspondents 
foreign policy correspondence, the, the coverage across the media is very limited and it's not framed on the basis of Britain being directly culpable and responsible for the unfolding atrocity. Now, there are many reasons for that uh, in terms of British foreign policy or establishment foreign policy journalism. Uh, there's often a revolving door. I remember Mark Leighty, the BBC defence correspondent during the Kosovo war, uh, his reports, which would, you know, he'd, he would say, I have no reason to doubt uh, NATO's account. Uh, Mark Leighty ended up uh, a year later as NATO spokesperson, official spokesperson. So he just, he, I mean, he just made it official, uh, which was at least honest of him. Um, but the direct close proximity of uh, of mainstream British foreign of, 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 of foreign policy correspondence, of defence correspondence, to the military industrial complex is very stark. So I want to give an example of this, which has come up in the last few days. The Telegraph's uh, defence correspondent is a guy called Con Coughlin. Con Coughlin, bless him. So Con Coughlin uh, was the foreign editor of the Telegraph. And we, just before we dismiss that, the Telegraph was until recently the most read broadsheet in the country. It's now second most. It's a respectable newspaper in the framing of these things. It's, uh, you know, it's journalists are fated, they're well connected, they're all the press conferences and so on and so forth. So just to give background on, on, on Coughlin, because I think this just gives us a case study of, of how this works. In 2000, an article revealed by Nick Davies, former investigative journalist at The Guardian, that Coughlin was fed material for years, which he just turned into Telegraph News articles, regardless of their basis. One of them was a false story fed to him by MI6, which he falsely ascribed to a financial uh, source, about Saif uh, Gaddafi, which led to the Sunday Telegraph having to apologise uh, for libel. Other stories published by him included front page splash, terrorists behind September the 11th strike was trained by Saddam. It was fed by a forged letter, which was fed to him. He went on NBC, to t and remember that at the time, George Bush's administration tried to link uh, Al-Qaeda to Saddam Hussein's secularist uh, tyranny on the basis of, of justifying the invasion of Iraq. So Con Coughlin was quite useful. He went on NBC to say this was real concrete proof that Al-Qaeda was working with Saddam, an invaluable claim. As Newsweek notes, Coughlin's story was apparently written with a political purpose, no kidding, to bolster Bush administration claims of a connection between Al-Qaeda and Saddam uh, Saddam's regime. As his so-called story fell apart, he said, there's no way of verifying it. It's our job as journalists to air these things and see what happens. Just throw out, just throw it out there. Great. Uh, a book by the Pulitzer-winning journalist Ron Suskin, several years later, claims the Bush administration just forged the letter and fed it to him. Uh, Coughlin, he says, was a journalist whom the Bush administration thinks very highly of and was a favourite of the neocons in the US government. Uh, he got the letter from the former CIA and MI6 agent, the former Iraqi exile, Ayad Alawi. The 45-minute claim, remember that claim? Well, British intelligence services were quite embarrassed about this particular claim because it was bollocks. But Coughlin went to Iraq uh, a few months afterwards and he found, a, he found a source who claimed it was not 100% accurate, 200% accurate. And he said, actually, it wasn't 45 minutes, the source said. It was actually 30 minutes we would have done it. Um, and I'm sure the British intelligence services were delighted. Now, Con Coughlin, this is why I was interested in Con Coughlin. Con Coughlin went to a natural history museum reception last week, which was put on for the Saudi embassy. Uh, the natural history museum justified it on the basis they got lots of money from the Saudi dictatorship. Lovely. Um, and... Uh, he was one of the attendees, along with Rory Stewart, a Conservative uh, minister, um, and uh, Con Coughlin. So I, I was interested in Con Coughlin, because the next day, he then posted a uh, news report for the Telegraph, uh, which uh, he tweeted out on the basis of uh, the, that the dead, oh, sorry, the missing journalist was actually uh, a, a part of the mother, Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, and, and the, 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 the implication being, sort of had it coming. Uh, and just echo Saudi talking points. So I did some digging. And it's interesting, if you look back at his background, he, he conducted a fawning uh, uh, interview with Salman al Saud in, in, in March. He describes him as a human dynamo. With this young's royal at the helm, Saudi Arabia's pro future prospects clearly knows no bounds. His history exclusively, if you look through his articles, is just churning out Saudi propaganda and Saudi talking points. Uh, when Saudi Arabia and its allies clashed with Qatar, again, he just repeated that verbatim. Here's an example of a report. Uh, he wrote, as Brexit nears and the government seeks new trade opportunities, it's important Britain works out which countries are well disposed to its interests and those are hostile. 
Rather than offering to sell the Qataris Euroflighter warplanes, British interests would be far better served by developing the strong and long-standing ties it already has with countries such as Saudi Arabia. These are exciting times for the Saudis, the majority of whom are under 30, an economic and social revolution known as, I didn't get a sick bag, known as Vision 2030, being driven through by the country's dynamic crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, lucrative deals for British companies uh, and so on, but it depends on us choosing between countries like Saudi Arabia that are our friends and those that are not. Press releases for Saudi Arabia. Uh, he, writes for the uh, he writes for the National, uh, which is based in UAE, which is owned by the UAE's Deputy Prime Minister, a member of the ruling family, key Saudi allies. Almost every single report he writes is about the imminent danger of Iran. Uh, and what I found interesting, this was leaked to him, he's married to Catherine Bergen, who was a former Sun gossip columnist, who suddenly started churning out after meeting him pro Bahraini propaganda for the Daily Mail and other newspapers. Uh, she ended up working for lobbyist for Bahraini's dictatorship, propped up, as we know, by the 2011 Saudi dictator. Uh, ship. Uh, she uh, has emailed journalists from a Bahrain embassy email address, so she's directly working for the Bahrain's regime. Uh, she, uh, the shadowy PR firm she's part of apparently dissolved earlier this year. It was founded by a former Conservative councillor. In 2014, he sponsored a £1,000 per head table at Tory fundraising dinner. Uh, the guests on the table included Philip Hammond, who ended up Foreign Secretary, his wife, uh, the Tory chair of the all-party parliamentary group for Bahrain, and the Saudi chief executive of the Arab-British uh, Chamber of Commerce. He himself has a history of churning out pro-Bahraini propaganda, uh, including blogs such as Why is Britain Harboring Bahrain's Dissidents, uh, which is just a hatchet job on those dissidents. Uh, he wrote this blog after attending a seminar paid for by Bahrain's embassy. He denounced a group of Islamic radicals who are trying to overthrow the Bahraini government, one of our key allies, in the Gulf region, and so on and so forth. Uh, so he's a striking example of an influential journalist, a former foreign editor turned defence editor of one of the main broad sheets in the country, who is clearly a contact of the British security services, somebody at the absolute heart of a massive concerted lobbying effort by Gulf foreign uh, dictatorships, uh, who has uncritically regurgitated their propaganda uh, and their talking points, including justifying the calamitous, disastrous war uh, in Yemen. And I've asked this, you know, this, this point about the press, because we often hear moral panic about, I don't know, the canary, left-wing blogs. They're beyond the pale. They're a disgrace. They, they're a threat to journalism. What makes the Telegraph better than the canary, other than the veneer of respectability which has been conferred upon it because of its networks of influence and the people who back it. And just that final point on that, because this is something I'm very interested in looking at, which is the Saudi lobby in this country, which is extremely powerful, very well networked with British journalists. That's one example we've come up with. Um, a, uh, a Saudi, uh, a venture, there's a, at the moment, the independent newspaper, uh, which has been partly, you know, a, a, a bought up by a Saudi investor. Uh, they're now launching a, uh, a, a, a independent branded website with Saudi money, where the Tony Blair Institute has received millions of pounds worth of Saudi money, where Saudi money uh, is, in terms of network, in terms of uh, think tanks, in terms of lobbyists um, in this country, uh, whether it be uh, arts and culture, the Natural History Museum is not an exception. Uh, various other museums and you know arts and culture in this country are being Saudi money is being ploughed into them. We need to start talking about this and unpicking that because there's been absolutely no scrutiny or no appropriate scrutiny of the networks of power and influence that the Saudi regime exerts in this country, including over the media establishment. And that's one of the reasons that we haven't had anywhere near the scrutiny necessary, required, for one of the worst humanitarian crises on earth, which our own government is, is, is complicit in the deaths of every single child who, who will die, either of starvation or Western-supplied bombs. So I think, yes, we have, an op we have an opening now. This terrible crime committed against the journalist. It is tragic that it took this for us to get to this particular point. That's why books like this are very important. But however this opening happened, we need to use it because this uh, sordid alliance 
uh, represents a grave risk, well, it's an a existing threat to the lives of so many in Yemen um, and beyond. Um, it is, uh, a, it is a, you know, a genuine, one of the worst threats, arguably, to our collective safety. Uh, so I hope that this is the beginning of a debate which we can use as progressives, as critics of a Western foreign policy, which is responsible for some of the worst crimes committed in human history, that we can use this opening to start ourselves, uh, inserting ourselves into the argument and the debate where we won't have a liberal critique which effectively attempts to stabilise this relationship, but we ourselves build a movement that destabilises this vile alliance that exists between Britain, Saudi Arabia and the other states. It's an opportunity uh, for, for the worst possible circumstances. It is an opportunity. We have to seize it uh, for our own good and for the good of so many hundreds of millions of people in the world. Thank you.